Welcome to another In Wheel Time podcast, a 30-minute mini version of the In Wheel Time car show that airs live every Saturday morning, 8 to 11 a.m. Central. From the fabulous Hemi Hideout in Brookshire, Texas, it is the In Wheel Time car talk show. And coming up, we have guests from the Hideout along with folks from the car clubs attending today's cruise in. And there's more and more people walking in as we speak. Got to drive the 2023 new GMC Canyon pickup. I'll give you my thoughts on it. Conrad has the cruise in calendar. And we'll also have this week in auto history. Later, stories making automotive news headlines this week. Just ahead on the In Wheel Time Car Talk Show. Howdy along with Mike out of this world, Mars. King Conrad DeLong. We always need more Jeff Zeke. And raise yes, your sir. hand, Jeff. Right. Well, there you I'm go. Here. There he is. Here. That, uh, and we have Chief Engineer David Ainsley with us today. I don't know what he's doing, but giving me a hard he's time. He's making things and, huh, difficult. He's making is what things he's up. <laughs> I'm Don Armstrong. Glad you could join us today from the Hemi Hideout, Brookshire, Texas. Oh, my God, I-10, the Katy Freeway. Ooh. It'll never, ever be done. It is a ongoing, and it's just right out here. Right out here where we just are. This short little because, yeah, stretch. Because once you, once you get out here, that's when it all goes to hell yep. in a handbasket. Yep. And then right some, past here, opens up yep. wide open. They created some nice little chicanes you can go through and yep. all that. With so, walls right wall, next to your car. At no runoff area. Yep. You get in a wreck. It screws up the mm-hmm. whole world. Mm-hmm. Who designs construction and in a freeway like this? The, Who the does conc- that? The concrete companies, because they're always in business doing it, this. It is the most bizarre, messed up, jacked up thing and then I you have got ever. you got some knucklehead behind you that it's right on your bumper. Or... Like that, this that morning. Was me, Jeff. Oh, that was you. Like this morning, <laughs> I'm going down the free- and who is it? There's somebody on my left rear bumper. Follow me. I speed up, he speeds up. I slow down, he speeds slows down. Yeah. I, what is that? He goes, I'm in his blind spot. I'm going to stay here just to torment. Who does that? It was yeah. Conrad. Again. It wasn't Conrad. <laughs> it wasn't Conrad. No, he doesn't. Because I he, pass people. At speed, I pass people. You Well, we know that. There's no doubt about that. We were going to have a uh, very nice uh, little segment here, but we've come to find out that we can't do it because he's we have no it. connection. He's working. Is he working yeah, on it? He's working okay. on the audio. So we're going to let him continue to do that while I do a segment here on Hemmings Marketplace Sold Cars Roundup. I have two right off the bat, one for Conrad and one for Jeffrey. All right. Uh, this was sold a uh, week before last, a 1964 Oldsmobile f 85. So explain to everybody what an F85 is. So the, the A body, the cutlass body, the F85 was the entry level to the cutlass body. I see. And that was So did they sell the cutlass at the same time? Yeah, but the, the, the F85 was the stripper version of the cutlass. Okay. And then they'd have the cutlass and then the cutlass S, and then over time it became the cutlass supreme mm-hmm. as each level of cutlass increased Well, it's interesting content. because this reminds me. Of a Skylark it, that my same, parents had. Same a, body. A body. Yeah. The only thing really different about it is the grill and the back end. And the taillights. Yeah, taillights and that was yeah. the difference in all of the GM A bodies. So how much do you think uh, fairly stock looking 64 Oldsmobile F85 would sell for? 18000 So I'm, I was going to say seventeen. How about 8500 Oh, okay. Well, that's 8500 Well, I'm going to do this now, and then, and then, but you're ready to go? We think so. Oh, oh my gosh! It worked. It Hello. worked. Let me see. do Mike that again. Has magic. Do it in again. His do it again. At my age, I can only do it so many times. <laughs> <laughs> Becky, That's yeah, easy, no, she's not easy. listening, and she is here. So. Good thing I forgot she was here. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> I will knows. remind you that she's here, she and if knows. she's not, Thank she's you. listening. Um, okay, so for Jeff, we have, we have a '64 Cadillac Coupe. Deville. Oh, Deville was like the less. The, the was, that was the stripper version of the Deville. The cattle. Mm-hmm. Uh, and what year again, sir? It's a '64, and then it's a convertible. And a coupe oh. Deville. And a, a coupe Deville. Let's go twelve. Twelve. And you? I, I say because it's a convertible, I'll say seventeen. Okay. How about twenty-six two fifty? Wow, wow, way off. Twenty-six thousand. It's a nice looking. It looks all stock and everything. Yeah. You can take that home. I, I'm gonna and sleep on it. Okay. It won't fit in a garage today. No, it won't. No, it will not. It is pretty. Okay. Here's one. Uh, this is for you, David. It's a convertible. It's a minivan. A 1998 <laughs> Chevrolet Corvette. That's a C5. Okay. That's a C5. And 
Any guesses as to what this went for? It's a convertible C5. Looks like stock. It's nothing. It is not a ZR1 or a Z06 or any of that sort of stuff. Just a stock convertible Corvette C5. David, I can't hear you. Eighteen. David says twenty, and you say eighteen. Twelve. It sold for thirteen thousand six hundred and fifty dollars. Oh, oh, wow. I, Without going over, I don't know. Probably no, nah, not necessarily. You know, um, I didn't. I didn't pay very much Take for my C five, and it only one. had at the time sixteen thousand miles on it, which was low mileage. Yeah, mm-hmm. it is. It still has low mileage. A nineteen sixty four Chevrolet Impala, purple in color. It's a two door, but it's got the stock hubcaps on it. What do you think that sold for? Thirty. Jeff, seven grand. Sixteen thousand. Purple. Oh, that's what God. that's what lowered the price for yeah. me. Okay, uh, we're gonna we're gonna stop there, and I'm going to get out of my chair, and you guys can fill until I am I going to be able. I got to he- fill. I got to fill. Am I going to be able to? Uh, am I going to be able to? Uh, am I going to be able to hear anything? Just the microphone and to to John. Do you have John? Is John mic'd, or am I using that? No, mic? you're using mic'd. the stick mic. One mic. Stick <sighs> mic. Here we go. And here's the fill. Uh, update on Andretti, Conrad. Uh, Andretti will not be left without an F1 engine. Now, what is going on is that he's, they're going to give him an opportunity for different builders. The Alpine and Honda are the engine builders. Yeah. And what uh, is happening is they don't want to be part of Andretti. So FIA says, okay, you're going to pick one, and then you can build your own as you use these. So... Okay. General Motors is going to be building an engine. Probably in the next three to four years, he'll have a GM Cadillac See, and, and originally, I had heard that it was going to be the Honda, which is also the engine that McLaren's currently using. Right. McLaren's not happy either. No. Uh, it, and, neither one of them would be. Right. Which is odd because, to me, I would think the more people that are spending money on the engine would mean the more development work could be performed on the engine and the more power can be created. I mean, it's one of the reasons that the Mercedes engine is so good because it's like of the, what, 11 teams in F1? Well, there, there will be five now, or, yeah. Five or six of them are using Mercedes yeah. power yeah. plants. It, but the, the, it originally started out that Renault was going to give him the engine, and Renault didn't finish the paperwork, they didn't submit it on time, and now the FIA says, well, you got two choices. you got Alpine and Honda. So we'll see which one he picks. So. No, I would assume they'll go with Honda because that was the yeah, original. I would assume the original so too. thought. Yeah, and the Honda engines becoming competitive because mm-hmm. you've looked at you know now McLaren that was always a, a mid pack car is now qualifying in in uh, the top ten over and over again. So I would think he would choose the Honda. And I think the boys are ready. So I'm going to flick this over to a remote camera, and we'll see what you you're on. Donnie, you're on. You're good. Okay, well, thank you very much. John is taking care of one of the guests that are here, and uh, we are going to either talk with uh, him about the cars or the signs. John's going to run off and get somebody. But uh, at any rate, we are going to be here, and we're going to show everybody some of the uh, highlights of the Hemi hideout that we normally don't do because Mr. Morris has absconded with a camera. Okay. He stole it from somebody over there in Niederville. Oh, he borrowed anyway, it. Anyway, all right, so what do you want to start? You want to do the uh, Challenger? Uh, we can. Oh, no, but, but you had something in mind. No, it doesn't matter to me. Okay, let's do that. Okay, so for those that don't know, this has got a shaker hood, yes. so you can explain. Okay, so this is a 1970 uh, Challenger RT convertible they only made 11 of them in 1970 convertible hemi challengers this is not real this is a replica uh it's got a aftermarket hemi engine born a 383 but it's been rebuilt completely to spec as a, it would be a hemi it won the new england's concourse d'elegance uh first place prize for dodge nice but, but it's, it's a, a replica yeah and it's a convertible and that's what really makes it rare that's right that's right. Okay. Uh, we have to go back here and show the Roadrunner. Let's go. Let's go. Mars, you go that way. We'll go this way. And the reason that we need to show this car is because of the huge wing and the nose. And this is what makes this car different. And uh, I'll let you explain this car. 
Okay, so this is a 1970 Roadrunner Superbird, and uh, they made 1,840 of these back in 1970. Uh, they had to have one for every Plymouth dealership in America in order to race them in NASCAR. All were 444 barrels, uh, 277 were 446 packs, that's what this is, and 77 Hemis that year. And this was all to race in NASCAR and win like No Tomorrow, and they were ultimately outlawed. Exactly. They dominated in 1970, and just it was Dodge, Plymouth, Plymouth, Dodge, Dodge. Hemi had to go. Superbird was gone. The wing cars, that was the end of the show. Well, because it was all about the aerodynamics, and that's why it looks so weird. That's right. Exactly. Yeah. It looks strange on the street. I know it does, and it looks even stranger when you see it in person because you don't really realize how high up the bumper is off of the ground. That's true. Yeah, That's yeah. true. Okay. Uh, this is an orange. Is that a Coronet? That's a Dodge Coronet Super B, 1970. Uh, they made 34 Hemi Super Bs in 1970. These are really rare because only 34 were built. So uh, we have two of the four remaining in the Chrysler Registry that are numbers matching cars. Sweet. All right, so um, I want to get a couple more of these uh, before we leave the automobile business. Let's go. What? Which Good one? story on the purple one let's here. Go, let's go back here to the purple one. Okay. This is a, oh, it's a 446 pack. Oh, and it's got the uh, special hood on it. Yes, absolutely. Grabber hood. So 1970 Roadrunner convertible. Uh, again, uh, back in the day, there were a lot of 383 convertibles, but only 32 446 pack convertibles, only one Hemi that year. And so this is really rare to find. This was uh, bought in 1970, two months later, uh, was stolen, taken for a joyride, and then they ditched it in a river, and it stayed there 25 years until the river went down the top of the, of the windshield sticking out, and they pulled it out. So it's a 446-pack is like finding a diamond, really a rare car. And I can imagine it was probably in horrible condition. It was in horrible condition. It's been reskinned. It's still a numbers matching original, though. Wow. Uh, just a jewel of a car. That's truly amazing. Hey, while we're down here, Mars, let's let's bring bring everybody over here and look at a couple of signs, can we? If you don't mind, Mr. Mars, since Mr. Mars is the one that is uh, actually over here uh, running the camera, and this is something new for us. And uh, but I wanted to uh, I wanted to look at. And this is my favorite sign at this end of the building. I have several of them, but the Buster Brown shoes. Okay, so a good story on Buster Brown shoes. Uh, they were uh, out of St. Louis, Missouri, one of the first nationally distributed products in the United States. They were in every small town America uh, throughout the United States before UPS brown trucks, FedEx trucks, or computers in every small town. Amazing. But they were centrally located in St. Louis. Everybody remembers Buster Brown shoes. Yeah. We had, we had uh, uh, Red Goose shoes, and we also had Paul Parrott shoes in a larger city. Oh, my city. gosh, Paul Parrott, yes. Parrott. I remember. But that's because we're in, from the Houston area, and but if in the country, the Buster Brown. Everybody remembers Buster Brown. Well, I had Buster Brown in Waukesha, Wisconsin. Okay, and I, wa I want to particularly see this one because it caught my attention. This one here, the, the Coney Island one. Yes. Mr. Mars, you're going to have to go around this way and show that side. Coney Island. Okay, so Coney Island, that is actually a Coney Island sign, but we had to make the Coney Island Brooklyn, New York, and we added all the neon. We got a little bit carried away with the neon. That's why it's hidden back here in the back. But it's a, a cool piece. We just went overboard with neon. Uh, but a cool piece from yeah. uh, Coney Island. And, and by the way, Mr. Mars, if you could swing the camera around and look at the Paul Parrot up there in the corner, that's the Paul Parrot that we were looking at. Normally in towns of, say, 100,000 or more, you would see Paul Parrot or Red Goose shoes. But, again, Buster Brown was everywhere. Okay. Well, I like the Rio Grande cracked gasoline. Okay, that was the first branded gasoline ever sold in the United States out of Santa Barbara, California. They sold gasoline in Southern California and Arizona. And the sponsor for uh, the radio show, Calling All Cars, back in the day. Calling All Cars. Calling All Cars. That's right. Rio Grande Gasoline was a sponsor. And they advertised high-performance cracked gasoline. All gasoline is cracked. That's what the fire departments and the... the uh, uh, Real grand cracked gasoline. Cracked gasoline. Got to have some cracked gasoline. Go. Okay, and uh, uh, Mars, I want to come back here because this is part of the uh, John Hovis collection here at the Hemi Hideout. It's a couple of things back here. Well, actually, three things that I want to. Uh, one is this pickup truck back here. Tell me. 
1937 well, Plymouth. Uh, all original steel. Most of these cars would have by now, so it's significant. It's all steel. Plymouth in the pickup. Need to get. Yeah, they're kind of getting behind some walls on us, and Swayed. we can't hear them. So Jeff's gone to so tell them. I've been told that we're losing signal, so I need to be be out here. But but Mr. Morris, I want to talk about the chuck wagon. Okay. Chuck so if you wagon. could show the chuck wagon, sir. Yeah, chuck wagon is 1860. We bought this from a man in Bixby, Oklahoma, and uh, just a cool piece. An interesting thing about these wagons, uh, it has wood spokes, wood hubs, wood spokes, wood wheels, and the metal band around the wheel that most wagon wheels have. That metal band played two purposes. It made the wheel more durable, but the main reason was to tie the wood components together, and that's where the name tire came from. So, therefore, the uh, blacksmith would do that. That's right. They would uh, uh, heat up that ring and swell, you know, swell it out, and then it would shrink down on there. But, again, that's where that name, that was the first original tire. Awesome. Now, probably one of my favorite pieces here at the Hemi Hideout is this Dodge pickup truck. It's a power wagon, and you're, you're fine. You're uh, Mr. Mr. Mars is shooting the pictures back there behind us. But uh, tell us about this. 1947 Dodge Power Wagon. I absolutely love these trucks. They look so cool. They they started right after World War II. There were military vehicles, and 46 was the first year that they offered to the public. And even up until 1977, the same body style. They hadn't changed all those years. But just a cool. Everyone wants a power wagon. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and it's, it's a great, great, great design. Yeah. Is this a three-quarter ton or one ton? I'm not sure what the the capacity was, but it was one of the few. You had the uh, REO Speed Wagon, you had the uh, the Diamond T heavy duty trucks and the power wagon. All the rest were the small little flimsy stuff, you know, but just a cool truck. Uh, there's no doubt about it. John, thank you for this little brief uh, tour of part of the Hemi hideout. So um, what we're going to do now, Mr. Mars, is we're going to walk back over to our set piece over here where we all, a home base, so to speak. We're going to go back over here. Yeah, and, because, and, Thank you, John. And I know a little You're bit done. of the story about the power No, we're wagon. not done. The, you oh. know, the, I know a little this bit. This is of driftwood. The... Yes, actually, it's a cypress tree that floated down the uh, uh, Arkansas River during a flood, wedged where the Arkansas meets the Mississippi. Somebody had a recovery boat and pulled that tree out of there, and they sawed the tree in two and then trimmed all the roots off and then saw the bottom, made a heavy base, just a cool table, an unusual, uh, one of the eclectic pieces we have at Hemi. Well, where would you find something like that? Well, you got to have connections. Oh, for God's <laughs> sakes. Thank you, John. John Hovis, Mr. Hemi Hideout himself, ladies and gentlemen. So while I make my way back over here, um, I'm sorry, did, did, did you lose us? For no, you're while? good. You're no? good. Okay. Yes. Well, one of the things I also know about that uh, power wagon is I believe that was a, a Concours power wagon that scored, and I can't remember if it was 998 or 995 out of 1,000. So you talk about a, almost a perfect power wagon uh, in John's collection. It, it looks like it just came out of the showroom. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it, it's true. And then amazing. as you kind of wander around, it's, it's not everything automotive here. John's got a, a heart for Americana and just unique things. He's got a stunningly beautiful petrified wood table over there. Yep. That it, it's so just we just talked about that. Yeah. No, that was the that was the Driftwood. cypress. The okay. Driftwood. Talking about the table that's, they're sitting around. Yeah. I like the polar bear. I'm going to get a picture with the polar bear for yeah, you. Do, do I was that. attacked by a bear up in the UP. Did you know that? A what? In the UP, uh, in the Upper Peninsula. Was yeah. yeah. Statue and it kind of almost fell on me. Was... Of course it did. <laughs> All right, uh, let's do the cruising calendar, shall we? Let's try to stay on time here. <laughs> so, uh, uh, what do you got? Customs and Coffee Trilogy Brew in. Uh, in Spring, Texas, is tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Also tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. is Trucks and Tri-Fives meet at a 501 South Austin Avenue in Georgetown. So for our listeners up in the Austin area, you want to go see some beautiful Tri-Fives, head on up to Georgetown and yep. look at them. The, uh, the car meetup uh, at the D&M True Value at 400 West Montgomery in Willis, Texas. Yep. Is uh, tomorrow at 6 p.m. talking about Willis? <laughs> I knew he's going there. <laughs> and then at uh, noon tomorrow is Cruise Old Tomball on Main Street. Uh, and just gather up and cruise. It's a free cruise through Tomball. But I'll give you a, a warning. Be careful. The police there love revenue collection. 
the car church at Segundo Coffee Lab, uh, 711 Milby is tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. And then uh, Turbo Tuesday at Twin Peaks at Lewis Henna Boulevard in Round Rock is on the 24th at 7 p.m. Back to you, Don. Thank you so much, Conrad. Okay, time now for this hour's car review. <laughs> I had a chance to drive the 2023 GMC Canyon. Canyon. Sound familiar, Mars? This is like the third This will be the third one. Yeah, yeah. They, they, and we, and it, there's been a plethora, plethora of plethora. canyons. Or that, plethora. Yeah, either, well, or, theoretically. Either theoretically. It's a, it's a grand a canyon. Plethora. <laughs> theoretically. Theoretically. <laughs> theoretically, it's a plethora. <laughs> plethora. <laughs> I had my plethora changed one time. Really? Great. Oh, yeah. Uh, Did well, it help? I, nah, bro- I broke mine. Now you can get shots for it. <laughs> 2023 GMC Canyon. It comes in these trim levels. Elevation, AT4. AT4X and the Denali. And I will tell you that each trim level is different. There's a lot of differentiation between the four trim levels. Let me put it that way. This is the AT4. And uh, this would be your everyday camper kind of guy. This would, this would be the regular go to, most popular. This would be the volume truck. The volume for the truck. Canyon. Okay, it's a small pickup truck. It has uh, places for five folks to fit in there, including the driver. Exterior changes from last model year, well, complete redesign for 2023. And for 24, it's a carryover. Exterior features, best-looking small pickup truck on the market, in my opinion. I agree. Bulging fenders with black wheel opening trim. Sharp tire and wheel combos throughout all of the trim levels. Uh, it looks off-roady, and I think that you really want to have that kind of look. It gives a it a menacing truck. look. Yeah. Front skid plate uh, with a manly grill. Now, the skid plate on the AT4 is not the same skid plate that you'll find on the AT4X, which is a true off-road. It's kind of a glamour piece, if you will, up there. What I liked about it, I like the tailgate storage compartment and the bumper steps. There is a storage compartment that is closable and lockable. It's part of the tailgate, but it's on the inside of the tailgate. Making use of unused space. It's not not very deep, but you can put stuff back there. Yeah, you can put shoes back, wet shoes, wet clothes, wet towels. Beers. One guy figured he could, I was showing it too, said he thought his rifle would fit back there if he needed, if it got muddy or something. Duct tape and rope, yeah. Yeah, anything you want. (laughs) Shovels? No, Uh shovels go in the rest of it. Uh Uh-huh. Hidden compartments for any kind of uh, illegal substances. All that is uh, included in in the availability. Ready made. Ready made. Made for Michigan. Interior highlights. Multi-gender attractive dash. What? Did you you like that? Is that what they called it? Did you just make that up? I did. Did you like it? No. No. no, I I don't know. (laughs) No. No. We're going to go with the multi-gender because... Leslie likes it. I like it. That would make it multi-gender. She looks like she likes it, that look on her face. You were kind of scared by that, by that weren't you? Why were you scared? What scared you about it? Because today, have, have, you, have you gone to your insurance company and looked at the choices that you have when it comes to gender now? There's got to be like a dozen different genders. I thought there were only two. No, on, a, I think, on a California driver's license, there were 54 choices. I was going to say, there's a lot okay, more Okay, so 54 Conrad, choices. So make fun Conrad's of me, but this is a multi-gender attractive <laughs> dash with a big infotainment screen. Okay? That's how, what how I'm going with. Gotcha, gotcha. It's big. It takes up half the center console area. Easy to access wireless phone charging, comfortable seats with attractive materials and designs. Gear shift and four-wheel drive controls, easy to control, and nice placement on the center console. Cargo, small bed, but adequate for most. What I liked, actually, I liked all of it, except the gas gauge is hard to read. Oh. I had to find something wrong with it, but that's true. Well, the gas gauge is the, now. The I, whole I will gauge say, clusters a little different. Well. The, in the AT4, the gas, or the uh, instrument cluster is a different layout than it is in the AT4X. Oh, okay. The AT4, the display itself is rectangle. Right. Where the AT4X, it takes up the whole screen. It's uh-huh. different. 
But in both of them, Which the gas gauge the, is too dang small. So that means the Denali is even different from that because the Denali is what I had. I don't know. It wasn't like that. Uh, engine, 2.7 liter turbocharged four-cylinder with 310 horsepower, which is a lot for a four-banger. Mm -hmm. 430 pound-feet of torque, which is a lot. Eight-speed automatic transmission. It will tow up to 7,700 pounds. How'd you like it? I loved it. I absolutely did. did. It stay and in I, the right gear? Yep. And it didn't hunt for gears. Uh, very minimal turbo. It was, they did good. Well-tuned. Yep, they did good on this one. And you know me, I'm real sensitive to that kind of stuff because I had a car recently. I don't remember which one it was. But it was a complete disconnect between start-stop, uh, the transmission, and the engine, and with the turbocharged engine. And, and, and that, and that 2.7 seven, seven turbo four-cylinder is the base engine in the Silverado now. It's, and it's plenty. Trust me. It, it, it works real good. Uh, 17 miles per gallon city, 21 highway for combined a 19. That's what it's rated. I got 20 miles per gallon over wow. 729 miles. Well, you why, don't drive like why that long? Over here. Because I got saddled with it for two weeks. Ah. Because GM asked me if I would mind if they kept the Buick that I had scheduled because they had some other place for it. I said, right. that's fine. Because yeah. I like the truck. Uh, powertrain works well together. Ride and handling, smoother than the AT4X, but you would expect that because the AT4X is the off-road vehicle. More, more suspension. Yeah, uh, yeah, more suspension, shocks, that sort of thing. Uh, this is the truck for everybody. Well, I'll tell uh, you, like I mentioned last week, my wife liked that truck, wanted to know if we could keep it, and now she's comparing everything I get to that truck. Yeah. Well, I, I can understand why. Yeah. They're going to sell everyone that can make it more. What could use improvement in ride and handling? Not a. Base trim price, 43.9. Price as tested, 49.355. Yes, it had many extras lapped onto it. Now, you can get into uh, the canyon for 36.6. That's the base gut level price of the thing. Competitors, Chevy Colorado for 29.2. Ford Ranger for 29.585. And the Toyota Tacoma is 29.430. They're all right in there. This is a step above the Chevrolet because the Chevrolet is more competitive with what I just told you. It was okay. in an attractive color, too. That's a lot of, lot, The eyeball is a lot to do with it. Agreed. Right. Hey, the In Wheel Time Car Talk Show is available 24-7 through the iHeartRadio app. Just look for In Wheel Time Car Talk. We also video stream on Facebook, YouTube, and InWheelTime.com. And podcasts are available on over a dozen of the most popular podcast outlets. The In Wheel Time Car Talk Show continues right after this quick break. The original group of Loopy Tortilla Restaurants will have you telling your family and friends just what the original recipes mean when it comes to the best fajitas in Southeast Texas. Founder Stan Holt invites you to visit the original Loopy Tortilla near I-10 and Highway 6. Here's the original house that inspired the design of all the rest and the original charm that helped make Loopy Tortilla the go-to destination for Houston Tex-Mex. Speaking of original, nothing can compete with the original lime pepper marinade that everyone will agree makes Loopy Tortilla award-winning beef fajitas the best anywhere. Loopy Tortilla Katie is another location that gives you the same quality and service Houstonians have come to expect at Loopy's. It's located just off I-10 of the Grand Parkway at Kingsland Boulevard in Katy. Find yourself in Aggie Land? Head to the Loopy Tortilla in College Station, located just around the corner from Kyle Field. It's a great place to enjoy those famous frozen margaritas before or after the game. Headed east to Louisiana, stop in at the Loopy Tortilla in Beaumont. It twos on I-10. You can't miss it. The original group of Loopy Tortilla restaurants invites you in for the best Tex-Mex anywhere. Rogers, Dabbs, Chevrolet, and GM Performance have the absolute best price that you will find on GM Parts Plus, transmissions and engines. Over $25 million in parts and powertrain inventory and customer service that will be not matched by anyone in the country. Rogers, Dabbs, Chevrolet, and GM Performance, whether you are a drag racer, an oval track racer, a hot rodder, it matters not. Rogers, Dabbs, Chevrolet, and GM Performance will have the best price in the country, the best customer service, and the best delivery times that you will find on your GM parts. It can be on your dock, at your front door, in a matter of days. It's Rogers Dab Chevrolet GM Performance and customer service to boot. Contact our Texas team, Gina Shile Knowles at 713-907-0906 or Rodney Rodriguez at 512-300-4445. You will not find better service or better inventory in the country. Rogers Dabs and GM Performance. Houston's finest cars are invited to another Gulf Coast Auto Shield car social Saturday, December 2nd, and you're invited too. 
Show off your personal pride and joy, or just stop in to see the likes of Lucid, Lamborghini, Porsche, Ferrari, and more. Gulf Coast Auto Shield is your one-stop shop for paint detailing, coatings, window tent, clear bras, and wheel repair. The Car Social is your opportunity to get a tour of this state-of-the-art facility located at 11275 South Sam Houston Parkway, just south of the Southwest Freeway. It all takes place Saturday, December 2nd, 9 to noon. This is the perfect opportunity to connect with other car enthusiasts. From BMWs to Bentleys, Corvettes to McLarens, the Car Social is a different kind of show. Talk to the owners. See Gulf Coast Auto Shield's facility. You'll be amazed. Put it on your calendar now. The Gulf Coast Auto Shield Car Social, Saturday, December 2nd, 9 to noon at 11275 South Sam Houston Parkway, just south of the Southwest Freeway. The In Wheel Time Car Talk Show will be there, too. We'll see you then. That's it for this podcast episode of the In Wheel Time Car Show. I'm Don Armstrong, inviting you to join us for our live show every Saturday morning, 8 to 11 a.m. Central on Facebook, YouTube, Twitch, and our InWheelTime.com website. Podcasts are available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher.